Today, I am delighted to be joined by the captain of Australia's artistic swimming team set to compete at Tokyo, Emily Rogers. Emily has been on the fast track in the sport since she began qualifying for the Australian team two years after starting in the sport and has already represented Australia at an Olympics and a world championships. Thank you for chatting with me today, Emily. Yeah, no worries. Happy to be here. I'm excited. First of all, let's go back all the way to the beginning. Talk to me a little bit about your childhood and what sort of role sport played in it. Yeah, look, I was definitely a very sporty kid um, growing up. I was born in Brisbane, so um, a very hot climate. So everyone swam <laughs> in Brisbane. So I was definitely a water baby from the second I was in classes. So yeah, I've always been in the water, never a land sport person at all. Tried a little bit of netball growing up um, because I'm quite a tall person. But yeah, water was always where I love to be. And um, I did swimming for a really, really long time. And I remember in primary school, I um, we had to dress up as what you wanted to be when you grew up. And I dressed up as a swimmer and said that I was going to the Olympics in swimming. And that was something that I really wanted to do. Um, but yeah, when I got to high school, Swimming was still in my life, obviously, but um, yeah, I wasn't progressing as much as I wanted to. And I love to dance and I kind of combined both of my passions for dancing and swimming and found artistic swimming. And it was like right down the corner from me. So yeah, super, super lucky. What was it about artistic swimming that grabbed your attention? Obviously you mentioned sort of being interested in swimming, being interested in dancing, but when you sort of first saw the sport, what, what was it that you went, oh, this is really cool. This is something I want to be a part of. Yeah, um, I actually saw uh, Synchronized Swimming for the first time at the Commonwealth Games. I can't remember what year, um, but I remember just looking at the costumes and being like, oh my gosh, they're so sparkly. I love them. Like I'd love to wear something like that. And also just like the music. I'm very into, you know, music and love that they can hear the music under the water. I thought that was so fascinating. So I, yeah, I just fell in love with just the whole artistic side of it. And I remember sitting there with my sister and she was like, no sister of mine is ever wearing a nose clip. You are not doing that sport. And I was like, just watch me. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not your most conventional sport. <laughs> what was the exposure to it like as, as a kid? You mentioned it was, I think, just around the corner when you were growing up. Was that kind of the appeal to it as well? Um, I actually had no idea that it was just... 15 minutes around the corner from where I live so it was a great surprise and um yeah I just fell in love with it the second that I started and just never wanted to stop and here I am 10 years later <laughs> it's clearly the right path it's worked out well um do you remember when you sort of first joined up with a squad or joined up with a team what what the training was like what what the commitments was like and how was it uh dealing with that and balancing that with school, I guess, as a teenager. Yeah, it was really tricky. I remember um, I was at high school and I was into also performing in musicals and things like that. So I was actually, I auditioned for the school musical and was waiting to hear back to see if I got into the musical. And if I did, I was actually going to have to put Synchro a little bit on hold. Um, but I didn't get into the musical, so then I went and full force into synchro which was a blessing um so yeah it was very different to just lap swimming obviously we did a little bit of it um to start with in our practices but technique was everything in that first year which I think a lot of people do struggle with because it can be quite boring and meticulous but I found it something that you could really um you know, learn something new every single day and improve. And I just loved that it was so, there was so many things that you could do and you would never really get too bored because you were always learning a new technique or skill. So yeah, I just fell in love with it that way to start with, even before the routines. <laughs> do you remember what the musical was that you auditioned for that you, you didn't get in? Um, what was, I think it was Jekyll and Hyde. Musical. I think I was in year nine. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? Who knows what could have been? But clearly, it's worked yeah. out. <laughs> clearly, it's worked out yeah, well. Exactly. A real. This yeah. is the moment part of it, I guess. Um, 
Do you remember like your first competition after being involved in the squad? Do you remember, were you kind of thrown, I guess, pardon the pun, in the deep end a little bit in terms of let's just get you into competition and let's try and get you some exposure that way? Yeah, um, I did a few like local competitions in Melbourne. So I was in Melbourne at this point. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of a weird experience. I was just in um, a combo event, which was with 10 other people. Um, so a big team. So I didn't really have to do anything by myself, which was great. But I really looked up to those girls that were kind of my age doing solos. And I just wanted to be like them and do heaps of routines like they were doing. But yeah, I enjoyed every second of being in the combo. And I think we did, uh, I think we did a cheerleader routine, like a bring it on routine. So it was super fun. And yeah, I loved it. <laughs> What aspects of the sport did you find hardest early on? Was it some of the out of water stuff? Was it being underwater, holding your breath, things like that? Was there anything in particular that sort of sticks out as going, that was the hardest thing to get used to? Yeah, I think definitely holding your breath is a little bit, was the scary thing for me. Um, you know, you do hypoxic type work to get your breath um, really strong, but when you're doing those routines, it can get really, you know, it's kind of like you're running a marathon, but holding your breath. So it can get pretty scary. And then something that I'm still struggle with to this day is um, having no goggles. So that's just your sense of sight is gone as well. You know, you're upside down, it's blurry. You can't really see, but you're trying to match up with people. So yeah, it can be a little bit intimidating going to competitions and having to take the caps and goggles off, but you just kind of get used to it with time. For people who might not be aware, can you talk us through what that hypoxic breathing involves and I guess what the training is that goes into it? Yeah, um, with the hypoxic type work, we do a lot of um, lap swimming. So we're currently training in a 50 meter pool, so like an Olympic size pool, and we'll do like 50 meters freestyle, 25 meters underwater. Um, so we like to do on our backs and we do breaststroke on our back. Um, and then you'll probably do that for 300 meters. That's something just to kind of get us warm. Um, just, yeah, a lot of unders, we can sometimes do even 50 meter underwater. Um, we do need a little bit of mental preparation um, to do that. But yeah, just kind of trying to see as far as you can get, obviously still being safe. Um, but yeah, just really trying to hold your breath for as long as you can. And even freestyle, we try and hold our breath when we're doing our freestyle. So yeah. And then with training in general, um, we're currently at um, Canberra in the AIS and we're pretty much living here um, at the moment. We've been here since the end of January. Um, so about two months now. Um, we start our mornings with land for about an hour and a half, which can involve, we do gym twice a week. Um, and then on other days we do stretching or just, you know, our own body weight workout. And then we go to the pool for three hours in the morning, um, have lunch. Um, in the water, we kind of do lap swimming, like I was saying before, then we work on drills and technique, like our leg movement, arm movements, lots of repetition. <laughs> you can never do enough repetition in um, artistic swimming. And then, yeah, we kind of get to the routine side of things. So doing bigger sections of our routines and then putting it all together in what we call is a full, which can be a scary word when the coach says, all right, do a full. You're like, oh God, okay, here I go. I'm going to die, but it's fine. I'll get through it. Um, and we always pretty much finish our session with a full or multiple. So, and then we video review as well. Um, and then we do another land session for about an hour, which is more just stretching or we do yoga and things like that. And then another three hour pool session, which is pretty much the same as the morning, but we do um, a different routine. So we have two team routines, a tech and a free team. And then for me personally, I also do the duet as well, which is an extra two routines. So it can be a lot. That, that <laughs> Trying sounds... to go from routine to routine. Yeah, it's that's long. That's very full on. Yeah. Do you think that's something that yeah. people kind of don't appreciate about a sport like artistic swimming, just about, about how much effort goes in behind the scenes to, to pull off some of these routines? 
Yeah, I think so. I think because we're an artistic sport and when people see us perform, it can look very effortless and, you know, easy, but it's actually the complete opposite. So, and we also a synchronized sport as well. So we all eight of us have to be perfect doing the exact same movement at the exact same time. So it's just repetition. And we also do a thing called land drills on land where we use our arms and have to do it at the exact same time. So yeah, we have to train a lot to make sure that we're all doing the perfect thing that we want in the end. The big question, how long can you hold your breath for underwater? Have you have you put that uh, to the test? Yeah, I always get asked this question and I never know like how many minutes. Look, I'm if sure you're doing minutes, you, you're already at least two <laughs> minutes better than I am. So Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be a couple of minutes, but yeah, fifty meters is probably as long as I can go for now when we're moving, but yeah, we can hold our breath for a long time. <laughs> you got to just stay calm and just pretend that you're breathing when you're underwater <laughs> kind of helps. Have you had any moments during a routine where you've kind of, you felt like your breath go or something's gone wrong where you've been a bit nervous underwater? Yeah, definitely. Especially with the no goggles, I feel like I can't breathe as well. <laughs> or I feel like the water like goes through my eyes and then into my nose and I can't breathe. I'm not sure if that's actually a thing. Um, but yeah, there can definitely be moments where you're like, oh no, that wasn't a good breath. You can sometimes swallow water from someone else. And then you're like, oh God, stay calm. It's okay. You only got a half breath, but yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty strategic. We know when the hard parts are coming so you can calm your breath down a little bit, but yeah, it can be quite tricky when there's lots going on around you. Do you remember when you made your first representative team? It might it might have been like a state team after you moved it to Victoria or whatever it might be, the equivalent. But do you remember that feeling of sort of going, okay, now I've made this sort of progression in the sport. It's really time to take this seriously. Yeah, definitely. I went to my first nationals, which was in Perth in 2013. And I think I did a solo, which I love performing my solo um and the 20 actually no it must have been 2012 um the 2012 olympic team was there as well and they did a performance and i remember watching them and being like oh my gosh i want to do that that looks amazing they get to go to the olympics like i've always dreamed about and i remember just like looking up to them getting their autographs and i'd only been doing the sport for a year but i just knew that okay i've got to give this a go at least and see how i go yeah really inspirational <laughs> did you get a chance to speak to any of those athletes there at that event and did they kind of give you any words of advice going forward um i got to speak to them a little bit when i went up for the autograph um but not too much um, that I didn't really have anyone. Oh, actually I had one person in Victoria who was um, going to the Olympics that year. Um, but because I was so fresh, I was a little bit scared still. Um, but later on, she actually got to coach me for a while, which was amazing. And, you know, she got to teach me a lot of things that happened at the games and the experiences. So that was really, really cool. Well, that progression kind of went really quickly because not long later, you were in the Australian team, weren't you? You kind of are only a few years after starting in the sport. Yeah, I think it was about two and a bit years. I think 2014 was the first year that I was on the national team. Um, and yeah, there were other Olympic girls on that team. Some of them stayed at my house because I remember the camp was at, in Victoria and that was amazing. I was like, wow, I'm friends with two Olympians. Like they're so cool. And my mum was even fangirling over them. So yeah, pretty amazing. <laughs> I'll always remember that. And were they really welcoming? Because I guess a lot of the squad are quite young and lots of young athletes that are always coming through. Were they really welcoming to you and bringing you in, on board into the team? Yeah, definitely. I remember I wasn't very good, to be honest, when I <laughs> was on the team only after two years. Um, but we do spins. So we like, you know, go upside down and spin down. And I remember one of the Olympic girls coming up to me and being like, do you know that you're spinning the wrong way? And I was like, 
no, we all spin left shoulder back. And I was, I'd always done right. So she actually like went underwater and really showed me and helped me. And it was crazy because I was doing the other way, but it was just amazing that she actually took the time out of, you know, her training to teach me something that was so important in our sport. So yeah, it was really, really amazing. Being involved so well- in- being involved in the national squad, what sort of commitment, how much of an increase in commitment was it to sort of be like, all right, now I'm part of this squad. This is how my training is going to be. This is how many days a week, how many times a day. Yeah, it definitely ramped up super quickly to about like two sessions a day, um, going straight from, you know, in the mornings, going to the pool, going straight to school. And then even after school, going back to the pool. So a lot of commitment in that way and then also um back when i was 2015 when we started to really um go towards the worlds um we have other athletes in different states so we had to have camps in different states mostly canberra um, and perth so we kind of had to get together for two weeks mostly in the school holidays but sometimes not in the school holidays as well so missing out on a lot of school um, for those camps to get together with everyone. We'd have a couple of those a year and then obviously get even more towards the Worlds or the Olympics. So, yeah, it was a lot of pressure on schoolwork and training a lot and trying to just see my family and friends that I missed because I was still only really young. So kind of felt like I'd moved out of the house at like age 16, 17. So I grew up very quickly. (laughs) Yeah. Those worlds, you know, I think it was in 2015, the ones in Kazam, was that your first big, I guess, international tournament that you'd competed in? Yeah, my first really big competition. And that was still probably the biggest one I've ever done. Obviously the Olympics is a massive event, but um, worlds is really, really big for artistic swimming and especially being in Kazan, Russia, where Russia has won for the past 20 years. I've just never seen a stadium so massive before in my life. So it was insane, but super, super rewarding. And we had really great swims and we qualified for the game. So yeah, I look back on that competition um, really highly. Do you get nervous? How were you in that moment, I guess, being in such a big stadium and did you find that you were getting nervous or did adrenaline sort of kick in? Yeah, it's funny. I was even thinking the other day, like, God, I must have been so nervous before swimming at the Olympics. I I feel like my brain's kind of blocked it out or um, doesn't really remember, but I must have been quite nervous, but we have so much great mental preparation we spoke with a lot of psychologists that really helped us Um, we do a lot of visualization and um, we are kind of prepared for every single situation as weird as some of them can be so we were so so prepared but it really helps being in a team and being around each other and we all pump each other up and we're all feeling the same thing so yeah it's a really amazing moment standing in the what we call is a call room right before you walk out and we're all kind of holding hands and breathing and yeah you kind of just got to believe in yourself and trust that you've done the training and you're just going to go into automatic mode you're not even going (laughs) to think about anything else yeah how did you feel when you found out you'd qualified for the Rio Olympics it was I will never forget it was incredible we were that was I remember being so nervous then um we had done our tech team the day before um and we have to beat New Zealand to get into the games um so we were I think only one and a bit points ahead of them which we thought we'd be a little bit further ahead than what we were Um, So going into free team, we swam very early on in the competition, I think maybe even fifth or something like that. And New Zealand was swimming 20 something. So we had to wait a really long time um, to see their score. So I remember showering and, you know, taking as long as I could because I just didn't want to have to wait a really, really long time. Um, But we were all sitting um, in a circle holding hands and as they were swimming, we had this big scream so we could watch them. And then we just all like (laughs) held our breath as the score came up and then 
we all just screamed as the school appeared and I remember lots of tears and everything like that but it was yeah a moment I will never forget and cherish forever it just had been a really long journey and lots of ups and downs but we'd come on top and we were going to the Olympics so yeah really exciting do you have many Olympic memories from when you were a kid, like watching them on TV, looking up to any particular athletes and going, yeah, I, w- I want to be there. I want to be there one day. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember always getting up super early to watch the opening ceremony as a kid and, you know, the fireworks were amazing and still being into that whole swimming thing I really looked up to like Stephanie Rice and Liesl Jones and all of them they were just super super cool to me and watching them like in the relays was really incredible and kind of just the whole Australian swimming team I kind of looked up to being in that type of sport um but yeah just seeing their reactions to winning a medal and those amazing moments and yeah it's just something that I really wanted to be a part of what was the opening ceremony like in Rio was it did it live up to those expectations of what you saw in the early mornings in tv from back here in Australia yeah it definitely did it still doesn't feel real that I actually have been (laughs) to an opening ceremony Um, I didn't expect to feel so nervous and emotional all at the same time. Um, The Australian team obviously is near the beginning. So we all went through like the tunnel before you go out and everyone was, you know, cheering, Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. It was so loud. And I remember just getting so nervous all of a sudden. I was like, oh my gosh, there's going to be so many people watching us right now. So I grabbed one of my teammates' hands and, we held hands the whole time and yeah, it was a really special bonding moment and I didn't expect to feel that way, but I'm so glad I did. And I had someone there to support me and yeah, it still kind of feels like a blur, but yeah, the fireworks going off and actually seeing them in the sky was incredible. I wasn't watching it on the TV screen. So yeah, it was super crazy. (laughs) Makes me get goosebumps. Were there any athletes that you saw while you were there at the opening ceremony or in the village that you just kind of went, oh, my God, that that's that person? Or just, like, you got a little bit starstruck by? Yeah, definitely. I think as the games progressed and you saw who, like, won the medals, so it was, like, Simone Biles and then, like, um, Catherine who won the shooting in Australia and she got the gold medal and she brought it back to the village. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And I watched her win it and just being around all the other Australian athletes and we're all cheering on each other was in, insane and just felt so cool that they'd bring back these medals and then they'd just go sit on the couch and just like eat a bowl of cereal <laughs> like it was nothing but that's kind of what happens you win a medal and then it kind of sort of goes back to normal so yeah super super cool what was it like competing at Olympics obviously you mentioned how big the event was in Kazan even though it might not been might not have been as big did it just feel incredible to be there competing in an olympic games yeah definitely we swam in the pool that um diving used the other pool and i think even water polo used our pool as well so there was a lot going on um with other sports which was really cool to see um other athletes and then obviously being around the best in our sport as well so really just you know getting to look at everyone even though we need to be super focused when we're training but to be able to watch other teams compete at such a high level was really incredible and I remember after we swam our free team which was our final performance I looked up into the stands and there was a whole bunch of Australian athletes that had come to watch us and that was really cool and exciting because I didn't expect people to actually come to the venue and watch us. So, yeah, they were cheering so loud. And then you look to the other side of the stands and there's my family and they're going crazy. So, yeah, it was a really cool, like, bonding experience for Australia. Yeah. So I think the, the Australian team finished, I believe, eighth at that game. So I've got the scores in front of me, but there, there yeah. are lots of decimal points and I'm, I'm sure probably you're not even quite sure yet exactly how the scoring works to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty complicated and not going to lie. Yeah, there's like difficulty and 
artistic impression and yeah, pretty complicated. Do you sometimes get out of the water going, oh, that, that was an incredible routine, then just see the score go, what? And just get really confused still? Yeah, a little bit. It can be hard with artistic sports, you know. Sometimes you walk out and they see the country and they're like, oh, it's going to be this score. But we try and really just want to put out our best performance and no matter what if what the score is, as long as we've improved from our previous swim or we think that we've done everything as well as we can, then there's not really much more you can ask for. So, yeah, we're really just going for that this time and see what happens. Do you have any particular lasting memory of those Rio games? A lasting memory. Um, that's a good one. I remember the closing ceremony. It was raining <laughs> and we were all in like these poncho things and we were, I think a lot of athletes left because it was pretty crappy weather um but we all the whole synchro team stayed and we were standing on chairs and just dancing to Brazilian music weren't really sure what <laughs> was what they were singing but it was just like finally we could like celebrate and there was no pressure and stress and we could just let loose in the rain and um be you know this amazing team that we'd worked so hard and so many hours together and yeah i feel like they're definitely part of my family and you know they always will be so that's probably something that I always remember not the the free McDonald's <laughs> in the village that wasn't a, a highlight oh, that, was, that was pretty good I only went once because the line was so long but yeah that's pretty cool <laughs> not gonna lie so after Rio obviously come back to Australia I believe you, you moved over to Perth um what, what was behind that move and was it all just about taking sort of your artistic swimming to the next level yeah pretty much I moved at the end of 2018 with another girl from Victoria um majority of the athletes in the new squad were from Perth so it kind of just made sense to go where majority was and be able to swim with eight other people instead of just the two of us and really get that um, practice being in the pattern is what we call it. So yeah, that was one of the major reasons we moved and also yeah, the facilities in Perth are amazing and um, waste is incredible to us. So yeah, there were a few factors that contributed to that. And it kind of worked obviously competing in in the 2019 world champs and booking your ticket to Tokyo, I guess. I mean, before we get into all the events of last year, how was it, how exciting was it to know, okay, I'm going back to the Olympics again? Yeah, I still can't really believe it. I cried a lot when the email came out. Um, I was really happy with the results as well of the trials. I really wanted to redeem myself from my last ones as I didn't feel like I put out my best performance. So I was really happy that I put out my best performance and did really well. Um, but yeah, Worlds was another great, crazy experience and we beat the New Zealand girls by a lot, which was great. So I think we kind of knew after our first swim that we were pretty on track to qualifying. So put that pressure away a little bit, which was nice. Better than the 2015 ones. <laughs> Now let's obviously talk about 2020. I have a distinct memory of um, the artistic swimming team being one of the last, I guess, teams that were announced before the postponement announcement. I remember Ian Chesterman heading down to the AIS to announce the team. Then the next day he was up here for the sailing and chatting to him and him just saying, oh yeah, I think we're still all good to go. I think what's still going on is planned. Then in less than a week later, now it gets announced that the games are going to be postponed. Do you remember where you were when you found out they were going to be postponed 12 months and how you, how you felt? Yeah, I remember being back in Perth. So we'd done a camp in Canberra for a longer time than what we were expecting. Um, we were planning to go to France for a competition, um, but then, yeah, COVID hit and we we could have gone, but it was just too crazy at that time. Um, for us to do it so we had extended our camp in Canberra which was quite a lot to deal with already because you know we're supposed to be in Paris at the Eiffel Tower and we're stuck in Canberra um, so yeah we were back in Perth for probably 
two days or something and it was right before my birthday (laughs) and I think yeah I was just in my bedroom and then I saw on Instagram I think the um uh, the Australian Olympic team Instagram with the Sydney Harbour posted that it was postponed or something and yeah I think my phone blew up (laughs) immediately my mum all the girls like it was pretty crazy because we'd kind of joked like imagine if it does get postponed and we're like no way it's not gonna happen but when it did I was just like wow (laughs) I don't know I think I just went blank and needed the time to really process what actually was going on and so many things we didn't know what was going to happen so I think we still did a really good job of just trying to stay as calm as you can obviously feel the emotional emotions that you want to feel um but we kind of got back into the zoom workouts kind of maybe a week after and yeah I wanted to just keep going as much as we could because we just didn't know what was going to happen how did you find that you were taking the decision compared to maybe some of the other members of the team who hadn't been to Olympics? Was it a little bit harder for them, I guess, knowing that their Olympic debut had been pushed? Well, at that stage, it was a year, but there was no guarantee it was going to be a year later as well. Yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, being their first Olympics, it'd be devastating to have to postpone that again. But again, with the girls that have already been, you know, we're we were kind of all planning our retirement after the 2020 games. So now to have to put our retirement another year later was a lot as well, because we're a bit older than the other girls and um, me personally having to, you know, put uni on hold again and put, push that even further back. So yeah, I think for everyone, it was pretty crazy and everyone was feeling it in yeah very different ways, but still trying to push through. (laughs) You talk about retirement. People might be surprised by that when they say, hang on, I say you're only 22. You're talking about retiring from the sport already. But I guess that's kind of commonplace in artistic swimming. Yeah, I guess. There's obviously some people that can do it for a really long time. Um, I think it's a bit harder being in Australia because we um, don't really get as much funding as maybe other countries do we still get amazing um sponsorships and funding from the people that we are with but um we have to I didn't finish high school so I had to put that on hold um and again just having to put uni on hold is really difficult um we have to move to Canberra to be together so you can't really be in your own state so that's just a whole another thing having to be away from your loved ones so yeah, I guess it gets to a point where you've done your 10 years and you're kind of ready to move on and kind of be normal in a sense. And yeah, maybe I'll do some coaching or something like that. I definitely love to stay in the sport because it's my life. (laughs) Have you got a bit of a plan like that involved coaching uni of what you want to do after you do finish up in the sport? Yeah, I'd love to get stuck into some coaching for some of the clubs in Western Australia. Um, I'm doing a sport management degree, so I'd love to finish that off and not be in my first year at the age of 22 still. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've, I'm also like a swim teacher as well. So I'd love to get back into working and maybe working my way into that facility and using my degree in that way. So yeah. Still in the sport world, definitely. That won't be going anywhere, but yeah, (laughs) separating the athlete life. (laughs) How how do you feel about this year now? Uh, Do you have any concerns about heading over to Tokyo or do you feel confident that as long as everything's, all the boxes are ticked, you and your team, you'll feel really comfortable heading over to compete? Yeah, we've got so many amazing people helping us here at the AIS. you know, everyone really just wants us to have the best experience that we can and the best performance. So I feel really at ease that we're, you know, got the best people around us. Obviously, there's still, you know, concerns about the game being very different. Um, But yeah, we're going to be so prepared. And we're just going to be ready for any situation that's thrown at us. And we're really just focusing on those swims and making them so, so amazing that we can look back 
on this experience and be so proud of what we produced in a crazy world and a crazy time, but we're able to come on top of it. You speak about it being a very different event. I mean, it was just announced last week that international spectators won't be allowed to come. I mean, there are already restrictions on they can clap, but there's no cheering or anything like that. Will it be a bit weird having almost a a silent stadium to a certain degree? And also, I guess, not being able to have your family and friends come over to watch. Yeah, it's definitely going to be very different. Um, I think we've kind of all been preparing for that announcement to happen. So we've kind of been prepared that spectators won't be allowed to come. Um, But yeah, it's still disappointing, but we have the music that can, that makes the um, arena so loud. And I know that when we finish our performance, we all come together and we like hug each other in the water and we'll be cheering each other on. So yeah, it's just going to be different, but I'm sure we'll adapt to it and there'll be someone in the audience watching us. So if not, it'll be the other synchro girls and we all support one another. So, yeah. Do you find that having a crowd there to support you, you spoke about during Rio having fellow Aussie team members there and the crowd cheering you on, does that give you a real boost? And is that something that it, it might impact your performance a little bit or is it just something that I guess, especially in the last year or so, you've become accustomed to? Yeah, I guess you kind of become accustomed to it. Um, also, I feel like I remember those moments after the swim. So it's just a little cherry on top that I got to experience. But right before we walk out, we're just in go mode. So almost it might even be a blessing to us that there won't be as many people there. So we can really just focus on ourselves, not have heaps of noise going on and just really go out there and do our best thing ever. (laughs) I guess the other big change for this Olympics is the whole fly in, fly out plan that's kind of been said going in five days before coming out 48 hours after. Do you find that, especially with artistic swimming, that that probably won't impact you too much, that you don't really need to be on the ground? Or do you wish you had like a full week or two week preparation period to be able to be in Tokyo to get ready for the Games? Yeah, um, I think because it's in Tokyo, the time difference is great. So that's a positive to um, being in Australia. Um, Rio is a whole other situation so I'm glad we didn't have to do a fly and fly out there Um, but yeah I guess it kind of works in our favor we compete at the end of the games so we'll have you know at least a week training when the games are on Um, and we're kind of used to flying in and flying out for other competitions anyway so I feel like we will adapt well to that type of situation and yeah not too concerned about it. (laughs) Maybe just the heat, actually. But I think we already have some, yeah, things in place to get us used to the humidity and things like that, doing some training in the spa or something. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, those late July, early August days in Tokyo can get very warm. So that will be interesting to see. Um, I've just got a couple of last questions for you because you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate it. I guess more holistically about your involvement in the sport, do you – have a preference of what sort of event you like being involved in do you like kind of the duets the solo stuff being involved in the team events what what do you prefer um I think I've never done the duet before so I'm super excited to be able to do um the duet this time around um but because I haven't experienced it as much I just love the team events so much um being around my best friends and the ups and downs and being team captain and having to give the pep talk right before we walk out um, to compete is something that I really treasure. And um, all the girls are just amazing. And I think the team is just something that you all just feel when you've had a good swim, there's just a feel about it and you just can't even describe that feeling. But I just hope that we get that amazing feeling that we've all you know, we feel the synchronized energy around us and we're all calm and not killing each other and hitting each other. So yeah, I think the team is definitely something that I love the most. What makes a good pep talk? What what do you have in your locker that you pull out to to motivate the troops? Um, It depends on the team. Um, This team is uh, very different. We're a bit younger, a bit, you know, crazy. So we 
love music so we kind of put on a song that we all love and we dance around and be silly or um, we kind of have little sayings that we say to get each other pumped up we do a little like fist bump and put it in the air so <laughs> yeah it can be a little bit cringy and we do an Aussie 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 to you know get us really you know in that zone that we're representing our country so yeah I think that's what gives us the fire. Any go-to <laughs> songs in particular that, that are played before a competition? Um, at the moment, it's this song called Send It. So that's our thing at the moment. We want to send the lifts super high and we want us to be amazing. And, yeah, we kind of just say send it and that's our thing at the moment. Very nice. I mean, obviously there's a lot of early mornings, as we mentioned, involved in training for a sport like this. And I can imagine particularly when you're in Canberra at the AIS, there's some early mornings there in in the middle of the year where you just do not want to get out of your bed or your bunk and you just don't want to train at all. What motivates you on those mornings to go, no, I've got to get up whatever time the alarm is, I've got to get up, I've got to start training? Yeah, that's a good one. It's already getting, it's been raining the past five days here. So we're kind of already feeling the winter in March um luckily we don't do any 5am starts or anything like that so the sun is kind of up when we're up um but we always kind of know the plan for the next day or we know what goal we want to achieve for the next day so I think we're all very goal-oriented people and when that alarm goes off you know I think okay we're going to get this done today we're going to make this bit look better and we're only going to improve every single day. So let's just get in the water, get it done. And we're only going to benefit from it in the end. Yeah. And to end things off, what are you most proud of in your career to date? Oh, I think what I'm most proud of is each team is very different that I've swum in. You know, we've got different people every single time. And I think the process of where we come from to the end result just makes me so proud. And, you know, we train six plus hours in the water every day. That's a really, really long time. But um, I just think it's so worth it in the end when you see that end goal, that end swim, that, you know, hug to your teammate that you've done an amazing job. That's what makes me so proud and seeing where the girls come from when they've just started the sport to now. Um, is just amazing and I will always cherish those moments. Well, Emily, we cannot wait to see you create some more of those moments in Tokyo. Fingers crossed everything goes ahead. Uh, Good luck for the rest of um, the training period and the prep period ahead of it. And, yeah, we can't wait to see you competing over there for Australia and leading the team. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. (laughs) 